The text for this, the last Sunday of the church year, this Christ the King Sunday, is found in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4b to 8. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings of, on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Apostle John writes the book of Revelation to the seven churches that were in Asia Minor. The name of this book comes from the very first word, hapokalupsis, which means revelation. Not revelations plural, revelation singular. He begins by writing the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now it is most often understood that Jesus is revealing to John what will take place in the future, and that is true. That said, by saying the revelation of Jesus Christ, it could also be understood that the goal of the book of Revelation is to reveal Jesus Christ, to show you who Jesus Christ is. And John writes, Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and who keep it, what is found therein, because the moment is drawing near. Now for each of the pastors that received a copy of this letter, that we're going to read it out loud in the midst of a church service. And to all the parishioners who gathered to hear this word of God and take to heart its message of encouragement, they were blessed. This text is meant to encourage Christians, saying that in the midst of all trials and persecutions that they're enduring here on earth, Jesus is reigning from heaven, and that the saints who have died have entered into their blessed rest, and they're waiting for his return. And that all believers have this certainty that we will wear white robes, meaning that we will be cleansed, and that we will be invited to the banquet, to the great marriage feast of the Lamb that will have no end, that we will be raised to eternal life, you are blessed if you are attentive to the content of this revelation. You won't be blessed because you have information that other people don't have about the future. But you will be blessed because you will be ready for the day when your Lord will come again. And you are looking forward to meeting your Savior face to face. John begins in verse 4 in a way that often sounds like the way Paul begins his letters and often a structure that I use at the beginning of my sermons. Grace and peace to you. He says, grace and peace to you from God who was and who is and who is to come, from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, 
and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Now, by speaking words of grace and peace, he uses the Jewish word shalom, peace, that Jews used to greet one another. And haran is the normal Greek way of greeting one another, which sounds like um, the word that would be used to say grace. And it's a way of saying that whether you are Jew or Gentile, no matter who you are, God is speaking to you. He is welcoming you. He says, pay attention to what I'm saying to you. So then we have the question, who is this God who is speaking to us? It is the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. First we have the one who was and who is and who is to come. Now that is a reference to the personal name of God revealed in the Old Testament, Yahweh, what often appears as Lord in all capital letters in the Old Testament. The name that God revealed to Moses from the burning bush. Secondly, he speaks about the seven spirits that are before the throne of God. Now, in the Bible, when you, and especially in the book of Revelation, when you see the number seven, it represents God. And therefore, the seven spirits is a way to say the spirit of God, or in other words, the Holy Spirit. And then thirdly, he speaks of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is himself God. And Jesus is identified by three characteristics. First off, he's described as being the faithful witness. John, in the very first chapter of his gospel, writes, Nobody has seen God. God the Son, the only Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, is he who has made him known. Jesus is the faithful witness through whom you might know the Father. Now, a little bit later in the Gospel according to John, the Pharisees opposed Jesus by saying that he couldn't bear witness about himself. And Jesus answers them. He says, Okay, even if I give testimony about myself, my testimony, what I'm saying to you, is true. Because I know where I've come from, and I know where I'm going. And so even if I give testimony about myself, the Father who has sent me, he's also bearing witness about me. The debate between Jesus and the Pharisees continued until Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus claims this Old Testament name of God, Yahweh, for himself. He is revealing that he is the Lord. And these religious leaders respond by thinking that Jesus has blasphemed. They pick up stones and they're going to stone Jesus to death for his blasphemy. And if Jesus did blaspheme, they would be right. But they weren't. And for a third witness, Jesus was before Pilate. And he says, I've come into this world. It is to bear witness to the truth. Every person of the truth hears my voice. Jesus is the faithful witness who reveals God. Listen to him. This brings us to the second characteristic about Jesus. That he is the firstborn from among the dead. Jesus Christ is risen. Now, he's not like those that were dead and brought back to life. People that we can think of like Lazarus or the, the son of the widow of Nain or Jairus' daughter. No. Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He who has conquered death. Death can no longer hold him and he will never again die. He left the grave. And so we have this expression, the firstborn from among the dead. It is not just a, a chronological reference, the first one to be raised, but it's a way of saying that he has dominion over death. 
We see a similar structure when Paul writes that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. It's not saying that Jesus was the first being to be created, but rather that Jesus has preeminence. He rules over creation. And so it is in this text today that he has dominion over death. He holds the keys to death and the grave. As the firstborn from the dead, Jesus will raise all the dead. He will raise you on the last day, bodily. And then we have this third characteristic about Jesus, that he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's not just the first among many or the most important among many, but he's the very source of all the authority of all the kings of the earth. And so in the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, we read, or 14, we read, to him is given all dominion and glory and the kingdom and all the peoples and the nations and men of every language served him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never end. And his kingdom will never be destroyed. John continues with this doxology of King Jesus. To him who has loved us, who has washed us of our sins by his blood, and who has made us a kingdom, priests for God, his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This doxology, this expression of glory and praise to Jesus, reveals his very nature. First, Jesus loves us. Now, of course, there are the kings of the nations that can rule their kingdom and take care of their citizens. But Jesus, as king, loves us. He knows you and is personally interested in you. He has washed you of your sins by his blood. That is the proof of his love. Your king was dressed in a purple robe and mocked by Roman soldiers and crowned with thorns. And Pilate dictated what was to be placed above his head, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Not because he believed in Jesus as the king, but because he was mocking him. Jesus didn't gather an army on earth to go into combat for him, to defend him. But Jesus went up against our real enemies, the true enemies of sin and death and the devil. And by his death on the cross, he washes you of all of your sins by his blood. And it is by this very self-same act that he establishes his kingdom of grace. Jesus already reigned over all creation from heaven, but he established his church where he would rule in our lives. And he does it by letting us accept that he has washed us of our sins. You are a citizen of this kingdom of Jesus, not because of the country in which you were born, where you might be a citizen of this or that country, but you are a citizen in Christ because you've been baptized, you've been washed of your sins, that you have been born again, born from above, born from God. And so it is that you are a priest for God. And you, you worship him, you serve him as a priest by your prayers. You offer spiritual sacrifices to God that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And in fact, your body is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. And so it is that the church is waiting for the coming of Christ as John describes it. He's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the families of the earth will weep bitterly over him. And so, amen. It's 
a repetition of Daniel chapter 7. The fulfillment of the prophecy of Jesus who says to the members of the Sanhedrin that condemned him, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right of the all-powerful one coming in the clouds of heaven. And for those who rejected Jesus, his return will be terrifying because they will realize that the moment of judgment will have come. But for you, the coming of Jesus shouldn't be a source of fear because Paul writes in his first letter to the Thessalonians, we who are alive at his coming, we will together be lifted up with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Encourage one another with these words. It seems that God the Father takes the very last word of our text and speaks up. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. He who was and who is and who is to come. The All-Powerful. The Father bears witness to Jesus. And this book of Revelation, as much as it reveals what will happen in the future, reveals who Jesus is and what he has done. Jesus, the only begotten Son of the Father, is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth, their very source. He is the crucified one who loves us, who washes us of our sins, who makes us a kingdom of priests for God. And so it is this Sunday, this Christ the King Sunday, our attention is directed once again to Jesus so that you might trust in him, so that you would not despair. Jesus, who came as a little child at Christmas, who comes today through his word and through his sacraments, who will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and whose kingdom will have no end, to Jesus, our King, be glory and dominion forever and ever. And through Jesus, you will enter into that kingdom. Lord Jesus, thy kingdom come. Amen.